My name is Jonathan Beaver. I'm a senior research ethics uh, research fellow, um, postdoctoral fellow here at the Rock Ethics Institute, focusing on our Rise Up initiative, our research integrity in science and engineering initiative. I'd like to thank our staff, uh, Rob Peeler, Deborah Chirilanis, and Carolyn Unbrook for their help in organizing the series. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, Michael Rory, who's a senior at um, State High here uh, in town, and Kristen Bergman, who's a recent grad in Phil and Bioethics, and they've been uh, essential in helping me organize the series and coming up with a list of questions for our panelists and thinking through this really complex issue of GMOs in the environment. I'd also like to thank, of course, uh, Doug and Julie Rock for their ongoing support of our work here at the Rock Ethics Institute. This evening, we're really honored to have a panel of excellent scholars joining us to discuss a topic that's of significant public and scientific interest. Discussions about GMOs are fraught with strong feelings, a wide range of social and scientific values and knowledge, and quite a bit of ongoing confusion. Even as recently as a few nights ago, ABC's Jimmy Kimmel poked fun at that confusion. I don't know if anybody, any of you saw that spot. He interviewed people in his standard way at a local farmer's market and found that several people were vehemently opposed to GMOs, even though they didn't really know what GMO stood for. One of my favorite responses to his question that he asked everybody, what is a GMO, was, uh, um, it's some corn bad stuff, right? <laughs> so we're hoping to move a little bit beyond that tonight. I don't think any of us in this room are at that point in the, uh, in the understanding of GMOs in the environment. But there's been a lot of public conversation around genetically modified organisms that's centered on the question of food safety. Whether and to what extent GMOs bring a goodness or a badness into the food that we consume, that we eat. The topic of food safety is an important one, of course. But there's a much wider range of potential ethical issues related to GMOs that's been under-examined from our perspective. So tonight, we'd like your help in um, simply broadening the important questions about food safety or placing it as one potential ethical concern among others in order to help us focus in on the broader ethical questions about the impacts and roles of GMOs in the environment, the topic of our panel discussion tonight. Our goal in this discussion is to help us unpack and understand this range, this broad range of environmental concerns about genetically modified organisms. We had worried that there may be some vehement emotional uh, affect going on in the room tonight around genetically modified organisms. I'm excited about that. In fact, a colleague of mine at the Rock Ethics Institute told me today, the best thing that could happen from the Rock's perspective is shouting at a research ethics lecture event. Um, I take a more moderate approach than that, so I prefer we don't have shouting. If they're shouting, it's a little out of my control, much like the video streaming. So, um, but part of the appeal for me for an event like this is the, the even-keeled discussion that can come out from a group of a very different perspectives, talking about a very uh, potentially heated topic. So with that, introductions. Going from my right, uh, farther to my right, as it turns out, we've got Dave Mortensen, a professor of weed and applied plant ecology here at Penn State University. Mortensen uh, applies his background in applied plant ecology and ecologically based pest management to improve the sustainability of land resource management. His work explores the interplay between the ecology of agricultural fields, field edges, and forest fragments. Uh, next to uh, Dr. Mortensen's right, we've got Dr. Bart Gremen, a professor of ethics and life sciences at Wenigan University and senior research associate at the Oxford Uhero Center for Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford. He manages the society clusters in the Center for Biosystems Genomics. And his current research focuses on the ethical and societal issues in emerging technologies, genomics, nanotechnology, genetic engineering, and synthetic biology. To Dr. Gremmen's right, we have Paul Thompson. Professor Thompson holds the W.K. Kellogg Chair in Agricultural Food and Community Ethics at Michigan State University in East Lansing. His research has centered on ethical and philosophical questions associated with agriculture and food and especially concerning the guidance and development of agricultural technoscience. This research focus has led him to undertake a series of projects on the application of recombinant DNA techniques to agricultural crops and food animals. And finally, to Dr. Thompson's right, we have Professor Kyle White, who's an assistant professor of philosophy at Michigan State University and affiliated faculty for peace and justice studies, environmental science and policy at the Center for Regional Food Systems, animal studies, and American Indian studies. Professor Wright writes on environmental justice, the philosophy of technology, and American Indian philosophy. His most recent research addressed moral and political issues 
concerning climate change impacts on indigenous communities. So I'm very excited to have this four, as you can tell, very diverse group of panelists before you this evening, and we're excited for the conversation. As I said, the last thing I want to do for you in just a couple of minutes is to tell you the story that we tell ourselves at the Rock Ethics Institute about um, ethical decision making. And I want to keep this pretty simple. There's a lot more to say. But just so we all have some sort of standard approach, we think in terms of a three-part um, understanding of research ethics at the Rock Ethics Institute. The first component of this is research integrity. Research integrity is a phrase you've heard at the university before, having to do with codes of ethics, regulations, laws, and policies. And that's often what's taught in sort of the standard responsible conduct of research programs. What we try to do here at the Rock Ethics Institute is think about a second level to that discussion, um, broader impacts, a phrase we pulled from the National Science Foundation. Broader impacts applies directly as it, as it seems um, to these broader social and political and ethical impacts that happen outside of the experimental design, outside of the scientific process, but directly from, causally related to that process. And there's a third level, and this is perhaps the most uh, complex one, but I think fundamentally the most important one, and this our director, Nancy Tuana, has called embedded ethics. And embedded ethics are, is an understanding of the ways that values and norms are embedded or imbued through the practice of science. Fundamentally, from the frame, even the framing the questions we ask as scientists and researchers, there are norms and values that guide that process. And so a goal for our research ethics lecture series, and again for our panel this evening, is to get at all three of those interrelated levels. Um, there are lots of different ways this can happen. There are this is a very complex problem, as you'll see this evening. So there are going to be a variety of values, variety of topics discussed, and hopefully by the end of the evening, you'll have a, bigger, a better understanding of the breadth of issues addressed. And in fact, my colleagues Mike and Kristen and I did a little experiment where we listed out some topics and some values we thought were at stake in genetically modified organisms. And we mapped those. We did a concept map. And we made circles of each concept or value that we thought was most important. And the least important got the smallest circle. We did this independently and compared. And even for the three of us who have done this lit review and worked together for several months, came up with very different um, personal, personal values around GMOs. So this is something else to keep in mind. And the power of a discussion like this this evening is that we've all got very different perspectives. And even though there may be a lot of overlap, I hope there is a lot of overlap, the varying perspectives are what we're after. Trying to understand the, the, um, the strength of other people's perspectives is key to doing this work in research ethics. So with that, my long-winded spiel, I'm very happy to introduce our panelists. Uh, please help me welcome them, and we'll get started. So thank you, panelists, for joining us. Um, we just wanted to start with a very broad question that you might each address in turn. Um, it's broad in the sense that we're interested in uh, what ethical issues related to this topic of GMOs in the environment do you think are the most important? So I can start. Um, I, I guess I would list uh, three issues broadly defined. I think the uh, the first, uh, I might have initially characterized it as the labeling issue, but I think it's a broader issue. It really has to do with uh, uh, the impact of GMOs, but really it's not limited to GMOs, on uh, people's ability to uh, have control over what they eat, what they grow, um, and to uh, be able to uh, pursue a pretty broad set of values in terms of uh, the way that they relate to their food. Uh, the second one, uh, I would say, would be issues around intellectual property. These are not entirely separate issues. Uh, and then the third that I would list would be um, what about uh, what will actually be the ultimate impact on uh, farmers in developing countries uh, that uh, we associate with the whole package of intellectual property rights, uh, market structure, uh, international trade rules. Uh, that are kind of wrapped around GMO technology. I think those would be the three questions I'd surface. Okay, I would uh, like to add to that uh, the problem of naturalness, because when you look at the environment, is it natural that there are GMOs in the field? And what's the impact? 
And my answer would be that uh, that's that question you can ask of any plant in the field. Because for thousands of years we have domesticated all kinds of plants without any problem. And now suddenly there are other plants called GMOs and they are a problem. And my point is maybe there are lots of ethical problems, like Paul mentions, but are they specific of GMOs? And I would like to say no. I think the one that, that I think about most and concerns me most um, is the uh, is the tight link between genetically modified crops and the input traits they're bred to um, to perform as. So most of the genetic modification, oh, the overwhelming majority, has been to basically alter the way we use chemical inputs, herbicides, insecticides in particular, um, fungicides as well. And um, what we're seeing is, at least on the weed side, and, and, and actually I did some phoning with colleagues in the Midwest in, in the field of entomology, perhaps with some of the crops for insect protection, but certainly with weeds, is um, genetically engineering the crop so that you can use a pesticide, a herbicide, and those herbicides are failing due to resistance and we're using more and more of the herbicides. We've projected two to three-fold increases in herbicides. 80% of the pesticides used in U.S. grain production are herbicides. So when we increase herbicide production two to three-fold, uh, we're increasing pesticide use almost by the same amount. That's a big concern of mine. I think it raises all sorts of ethical questions that trouble me. As you may have caught from my bio, I'm a participatory researcher and I'm also a, a tribal member and I, I work directly with tribes in terms of building indigenous nationhood, uh, mainly in North America, but I've also done some work internationally. And one of the key environmental issues with GMOs that a lot of folks that I work with bring up is that uh, a lot of indigenous people place importance on relationships that their communities have had with certain plants and animals since time immemorial. And there's a concern that uh, GMO technology might be disruptive of those relationships uh, or that there's no way that they could know in advance before those technologies uh, are deployed. Uh, another issue is that indigenous people have their own conceptions of environmental stewardship uh, their own conceptions of food production and food sovereignty. And there's also a concern that uh, the introduction of certain GMOs will be disruptive of the kind of biodiversity or conservation practices that indigenous people uh, favor and value and, and may have been doing for a long, long time. Uh, and finally, there, there's also an issue. I, I work with tribes, too, that are involved in commercial agriculture and the commercial forestry and industries that you see non-native people also involved in. And there, there is a concern that tribal governments won't be able to exercise the kind of regulatory authority or the authority over how research is used to protect their citizens from potential environmental impacts of the uh, you know, introduction of, of GMOs through commercial use or through experimentation. I'd like to follow up both, I think, with um, Kyle and Bart. I think I'd like to draw a connection there. So um, one of the ethical issues that Kristen and Mike and I had drawn out is this idea of sanctity or naturalness. Some people cash it out in terms of uh, an organism's telos or its end-related end development. Um, and I think, Kyle, it relates directly to questions about uh, connectedness to place that you're drawing out from your work in indigenous philosophy, too. Um, but I, I wonder if the panel could respond to this idea that the argument that an animal or a plant's genetic code has some sort of inherent naturalness to it or sanctity to it, and that's a reason why we ought not manipulate it genetically. Um, this is an argument that we hear often in the literature and often in public debates as well. And there's a, it's, a, it's one of those deeply um, ontological questions, really, these deeply fundamental questions about a thing's being. So I wonder if you might respond to that. 
Yeah, the problem is genes don't exist. They are uh, something, a conceptual unity in science. And if you look back from a historical perspective, the concept of gene is constantly changing. So 100 years ago, it meant a totally different thing. And uh, so science progress means that some of the things, they, the earlier knowledge is outdated, buried. And so if you say natural is connected to genes, that I, think, I don't think that fits well also. Uh, in science, there's evolution theory. And evolution theory, I, in my mind, says that plants, organisms in general, constantly change, adapt. Huh? And the environment, environment changes. They, plants, changes. So if, how could then the current genome of a plant uh, be uh, sacred? Because it is just in evolved. And uh, OK, uh, integrity is something else where you say, OK, uh, we as humans, uh, are we allowed to open up the, the, the genome and insert things that are more or less never, that could never be, have been inserted in a plant whatsoever. For example, the, one of the first patents uh, was about scorpion genes in uh, lettuce. And uh, Greenpeace in, in Europe used this as to say, OK, people, that's what's going to happen. Uh, uh, poison in your food. And, and I think, OK, that's a kind of emotion. It is also, uh, it was a real pat patent, so it was not just a uh, fantasy. But of course, it's all about what are we going to do then with the genes of scorpions, yes or no? Because also we could also take a potato and use uh, resistant genes from the wild varieties. And I think nobody would say, OK, that's wrong, because uh, a potato in the same species, uh, it's called cisgenesis now, uh, why is that wrong? Yeah, it, is, it takes you only a few years, and doing it another way takes you maybe five, 20 years or 15 years. So OK, for me, there is no, uh, that the argument it is uh, yeah, s sacred is, from a scientific point of view, uh, not feasible. Yeah, I'd like to address that question from a, a different angle. Uh, in the, the Great Lakes region, where I do most of, of my work, um, uh, you know, it, it, if you look at the history of, of, of settler colonialism, uh, you know, tribes had their own way of stewarding the environment, and those ways of stewardship were tied to how tribes governed themselves. And so if you look at uh, things that settler societies did, like the US, such as deforestation and pollution of water and so on, each of those changes to the environment then threatened those tribal family structures and clan structures and political structures that were associated with those particular plants and animals or with those particular resources like, uh, like water. So. On the one hand, you get this idea that for tribes trying to resist and, and carve out a space to, to live in, you know, in, in the face of settler colonialism, it's important to be able to maintain certain kinds of relationships to the same plants and animals uh, as in the same ones that your ancestors uh, lived with because it's hard to motivate a lot of people to want to conserve and protect the environment if they don't see themselves as participating in those uh, tribal systems of stewardship. So that it's, it's really a, a very important strategy for resisting settler colonialism and for living at peace with yourself um, to be able to engage in practices that really can only be done with certain plants and animals. So for a lot of tribes, they see the uh, potential uh, you know, introduction of a, of a genetically modified organism as, you know, potentially disruptive of that. Now, on the other hand, uh, the same tribes that are doing a lot of work to protect um, important plants and animals are also engaging in all sorts of other endeavors, like I mentioned earlier, you know, commercial agriculture, uh, uh, you know, commercial forest products, and, and so on. So this is not to say that everything that tribes do is, is, is based on 
the, the sanctity and the sacredness of certain plants and animals. But you can't take that away from tribes as a significant part of our being able to adapt to settler colonialism and to be able to, to live good lives. And the sorts of implementations that could come out of uh, research on genetically modified uh, organisms, if not properly regulated, I think a lot of folks would, would say is a potential threat to a lot of the progress that tribes have, 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 have made um, uh, you know, in this way. So there are two very different perspectives on, on that topic of naturalness. Uh, Dr. Grumman suggesting that there's sort of nothing, uh, let's say metaphysically, nothing fundamentally at stake in, in this concept of naturalness, naturalness or sacredness as it relates to genetic makeup. And Dr. White, your perspective seems to be that um, the importance of a concept like sacredness or naturalness is that it links a particular species to a particular place into a particular cultural uh, history, cultural geography of a particular people. So those are not unrelated, and yet they seem to be a little bit at odds with each other. And I wondered, uh, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Mortensen, if you'd like to uh, comment on the difference. Or I can also just jump in. Please, please, <laughs> I'm, no restrictions here. Yeah. Well, it's not to, w one thing to suggest is, I mean, obviously it depends on the tribe and depends on the, the culture as well. Um, but my, my position is actually not to say that tribes, uh, uh, that we talk to people in Indian country, that they have some view that there was like, you know, this one kind of plant or animal that going back to the creation story is always the one that was there. Right? Tr tribes are very a a adaptive and they've adapted for years and years and there's been all sorts of, of change going back to time immemorial. Um, so I don't think that, that you know, every tribe necessarily holds a, a view that, 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 that goes against what uh, Bart's view is per se. Um, but it is true, right, that there are certain plants and, and animals that at, at some point tribes had developed important relationships with and the potential of, uh, of, of genetic modification if not properly regulated and if the research is not done in collaboration with tribes, especially respecting free prior and informed consent, then it's especially threatening to indigenous communities that really have no reason to trust the United States or an academic institution or a non-governmental organization. I mean, take for example, in my culture, which is Anishinaabe, uh, wild rice is one of the key um, is one of the key plants, and it's actually in our creation story. We were told to stop migrating from the east when we arrived at the land where food grows on water, and so harvesting rice that grows in that way is is is, is extremely important. And so when universities or others in the region want to do research on genetic modification to support the paddy rice uh, industry, um, that, theoretically speaking, is a potential threat to those family, social, cultural, and political practices associated with the rice that already was growing mm -hmm. in a certain way. I think a danger, a danger in being on a panel like this is that you can, can, can deceive yourself into thinking you're an expert on a lot of things. And <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not an expert on the sanctity of, of introgression genes being placed in other organisms. But I, I did think about this a lot over the last several days. Some of these questions were shared with us in advance. And I, I, have, an, I have a problem as an ecologist with the potential for um, for altering the genome of an organism. Let's take salmon as an example. That are wild in the ocean, and where there is the potential for wild populations of that organism to receive the genes that have been inserted to confer weight gain or some uh, uh, some. Met metabolic handling of food or something like this. And, and so for me, I, I think the issue of sanctity comes up when I think about how it is that traits that we insert in crops, and I understand the argument about genetically modified versus classical breeding. I'm, I'm, I'm not naive about that. But traits that are taken from another organism put into salmon that then wind up in wild relatives of salmon that alter the fitness of that uh, of those salmon that are outcrossing where the genes are moving, that concerns me. I, 
I similarly have colleagues that work in uh, the region of the world where, where maize is, um, is naturally growing as a wild <laughs> relative and the concern about outcrossing of some of these traits into wild relatives to me is, is an area of significant concern when it comes to the sanctity of, of those organisms. And perhaps back to Paul's earlier comment, and I'm not sure this is what he was alluding to, but I, I think there is also a cultural concern when land races of a crop in a culture um, are undermined by, by some of the ad advanced genetics work that we do in the West or other places, um, and then introduce those, those, uh, those um, transformed plants in, into the wild where they can be, or into a, a cultivated cultural space where they can undo some of the land, the integrity of the land race crops. That's something that had been on our minds as well. And we were wondering, um, the three of us, I guess, but more generally, I think it's interesting whether uh, there's an ethical difference between gene flow from a GM crop to a wild species, as you were describing in the case of, potential case of genetically modified, and actual case of genetically modified salmon. Um, so a difference between gene flow from a GM crop to a wild species, or from a a uh, non-GMO crop to a wild species, if there are diff different et ethical considerations at play, uh, whether we should consider those in the same sort of vein, um, where you see the differences between those two cases. So I'll start this one off. I mean, I do think that there is um, a fairly long-standing tradition in ethics that uh, would see a systematic difference between um, a situation in which, uh, in order to attribute responsibility for some sort of unfortunate, untoward kind of causal consequence, uh, you need to have, uh, you need to be able to tie that to something that somebody did, right? So, um, you know, if, uh, uh, if there's a, a tornado and people lose their home, nobody's responsible for that. We might say it's an act of God, we might say it's chance, right? Um, you know, somebody probably did some conventional breeding to produce this traditional plant. Um, however, at least until comparatively recently, uh, they didn't know very much about what the genes were in that traditional plant, and uh, it would have been difficult to make a claim of ethical responsibility. Uh, so I do think that there is a sense in which the increased power and control that goes along with genetic engineering correlates with an increased sense of ethical responsibility for what happens. Um, now, if you sort of move away from the human activity here and just want to evaluate the consequences, I'm not necessarily sure uh, that there's a lot of difference. Um, I think it would certainly be possible uh, to uh, create inadvertently the kind of scenario that you've described with the salmon with um, some plant or animal that had been conventionally bred. I hope that was clear. <laughs> and, and for me, I, I think I would be looking, uh, I would want to look at it as a, as a trait by trait kind of basis. Um, and I do believe, at least I'm more familiar with the plant literature than I am with animal literature, that there are jumps that are possible that are very difficult through classical breeding uh, in terms of enhanced biomass production or resistance to some, some uh, xenobiotic applied to the plant or something like that. So I, I do see a distinction in that way. It's also, you could say, a matter of uh, context, because if you have these uh, modified salmon in Norway uh, in a situation where they can escape, then maybe after a while the escapees will mate with all the wild ones and there are only le hybrids left. So that would, uh, argument, biodiversity will be damaged. But you can also say, why not use them in a contained in containers somewhere where they cannot escape. So, for example, when the, in Israel, uh, 
they started uh, with GM algae. They did this in the desert where they have uh, these containers, so they couldn't escape. Because if the algae would escape, uh, it would be a disaster and maybe the whole world will, would suffer. So uh, you could say that is a kind of uh, way to secure that uh, as there's no way to escape. Of course, somebody could take them and throw them in a pond, of course. So, but yeah, there's always uh, the human aspect that uh, terrorist activity could uh, do that. But uh, you could say there's a case by case, step by step uh, rationality where uh, it's not a general principle, but you look at it uh, case by case, step by step, and then the context is very important. It's interesting to hear us move. Uh, we started asking questions about this, this norm of sanctity and naturalness that came up. And we've shifted a little bit now, um, thinking about uh, something along the lines of a value of stability, whether that's biological or ecological stability. And uh, Dr. Graham, you brought up uh, biodiversity, which is one of these heavily normative terms. We think biodiversity and its conservation is a good thing, and we ought to promote biodiversity. So we were wondering if there's any way that genetically modified crops or species could improve biodiversity, or alternatively, if you think that's not the right way to go, uh, to what extent could genetically modified organisms harm biodiversity? The biodiversity is an American invention. <laughs> <laughs> when the uh, biologist at some place thought that their colleagues got all the grants, the molecular science, took all their money, and the field biologists and ecologists were wondering what to do. And then they came up with the idea to use the word biodiversity, and I read it in someone's uh, autobiography, uh, uh, Living with Ants, it's called, I think, uh, that he uh, more or less uh, strategically used this in policy and and he says biodiversity itself is maybe a scientific uh, terminology, but it's not uh, a value laden. It was not a, a, a policy or whatever ethical thing. And um, you could say that, uh, of course, every new GM organism is uh, a plus, is added to biodiversity. But that's, I think, a yeah, simple fact. But also, uh, from evolution, you could also say, will they survive? Uh, if we got, in, in the Netherlands, we got potatoes, and we have GM potatoes, we, have, we don't have them, but we have them in, in trial fields. If they stay in the winter, they die. So uh, you could also say it doesn't matter because is there an evolutionary benefit for the organism? If not, it will die anyhow. So there is a kind of fitness and there's a kind of evolution process where uh, GMOs run, uh, the, then these genes will uh, be blocked or uh, the, the plants will, will die. So that, that's also a possibility that, uh, but of course they, they could become, sometimes they could they, they become in some circumstances a pest, and then other species may suffer, so even become extinct. So there the competition between uh, and that's the idea of superweeds uh, coming up. I wanted to just add that for um, <clears throat> some of the tribes I work with that are doing uh, restoration work, like say in the case of restoration of sturgeon for Anishinaabe people in the Great Lakes. So sturgeon's uh, another important species. It's a clan species. Uh, and other clans are actually, you know, have responsibilities uh, in relation to sturgeon. Sturgeon have moral responsibilities back to uh, to those uh, to, to, you know, to those clans. Uh, terms like biodiversity um, and so on for a lot, for a lot of uh, native folks, right? It, it always includes human beings as part of that diversity. So a lot of arguments you see with like sturgeon restoration is that it's important to try to restore the same sturgeon. I don't know if you guys have read the history of uh, degradation of, of sturgeon, but it's among the you know the horrors of settler colonialism in North America, given the importance of sturgeon to a lot of tribes. 
And so a lot of folks are going to say that it's extremely important that it's the same sturgeon because on the one hand, and I'm not a, a scientist, so I'll just sort of speak to what people say, um, but that you know the, the same sturgeon, for example, might be better adapted to that particular air area. Um, and it's also the case, like I was saying before, that the same sturgeon that was related to the families and, and clans and so on in that area is also the one that's going to be more motivational for people to be better stewards and uh, or stewards of the environment, right? So there, if you have a focus on on restoring a, a particular kind of, and I'll use the term biodiversity, a certain kind of biodiversity, right? Um, is often seen as having both benefits in terms of those plants or animals being more adaptive in that area, even the things like uh, climate change, but also having that motivational aspect to it to the human beings that live there. Um, and actually you see like in sturgeon restoration that when non-native people who live in the area see the way in which tribes identify with that same sturgeon, then they get a kind of motivation as well to be better stewards of the environment. So with some of the groups I, I work with, you see um, argue, arguments like this, and I think they're very uh, important arguments. I, I think, I think it's, it's also important. Um, it's maybe the, the main point that I would like to leave with, with the audience while we're here tonight to recognize that, that genetic modification doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens as part of a production system. And so when Jonathan asks about the potential impacts of the technology on biodiversity, the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that when it is a package, and, and so to be clear, the package is that you alter the crop genome using genetic modif modified methods so that you can apply a herbicide that would otherwise kill the crop plant. That herbicide use practice and the GMO are inextricably linked. They're one and the same in my mind. And when that herbicide starts to fail, which is what has happened on a very significant amount of the acreage across the United States, like 60 million acres, so approaching half of the corn and soybeans grown in the United States, when that starts to fail, and the technological solution is to put more genes into the crop so that the crop can sustain the application of more herbicide active ingredients, we're increasing herbicide use and disturbingly, we're increasing the use of certain herbicides that are particularly active on plants in the landscape, whether that's in the agricultural field, in the edges of the fields adjacent to the agricultural fields, and in the what we think of as the non-cropland adjacent to agricultural fields, riparian zones and hay fields, et cetera. So um, I have uh, quite a concern about the impact of the packaged technology on floristic biodiversity. And we have students here at Penn State that have been studying the impact of uncoupling between insects and plants, desirable insects, when you reduce the plant diversity, the insects that depend on those plants, and some of our entomologists would argue that many of the beneficial insects, the biocontrol insects that naturally occur in the landscape, they rely on one to three plant species to complete their life cycle. They're high fidelity insects. They have to have those plants on the landscape to complete their life cycle. Parasitoids, for example, are such insects that help with pest suppression in our agricultural fields. If we take that floristic diversity and dial it down through the package, we are um, not only dialing down the floristic diversity, but the insects that depend on those plants. So um, that's why at the outset when you were asking about what, what is the ethical issue that most concerns you, the ethical issue that most concerns me is packaging. And it's a concern specifically because of the, the nature of the systems problem. So 
to come full circle now to this question about biodiversity that we started with a minute ago, um, biodiversity is, is a normatively laden concept, for better or worse. It's got some, some goodness inherent to the idea of it, whatever its origins, um, whether that's from E.O. Wilson in the 60s in the US, which it probably is. Um, it's taken on a life of its own. It's really gained a lot of prevalence. And I think uh, one of the, the key takeaways um, that I think is really important in this conversation about GMOs and the environment is specifically um, Dr. Mortens and this idea that uh, GMOs are a systems problem. So we were wondering if it's the case that I think uh, Dr. Gremmen used this idea of super weeds, right? That one potential problem with a monoculturing of crops is that it leads to pesticide resistance weeds, which in turn, as you described, leads to further um, doubling or tripling or quadrupling of pesticide and herbicide use. Whether there are viable options or alternatives to that approach we seem to be stuck right now in a cycle where this is, uh, feels like an inevitability. Um, so breaking out of a complex systems problem like this, um, do you have thoughts on how that's possible, if that's possible? Since you were looking at me, Jonathan, I'll start, but we, <laughs> we need to not have me dominating the microphone on, on this. I, I, think, I think that we, it's essential that we, that we ratchet up um, the research that's needed to come up with more robust solutions to pest management. I'll say that right up front. So I, do we have the solutions? Uh, I know that we need to make improvements uh, on what we do have as alternatives. But um, there is work going on here elsewhere, and I'm not just saying research work, but I'm, I'm saying farmers doing the practice farmers through participatory research, working with other farmers to identify uh, robust solutions to their pest management problems. That include such things as cover cropping. Um, that include such things as considering to uh, not plant the GMO crop every once in a while so that you switch out of the pesticide regime that you're in that is selecting for resistance. It's a practice or at least that particular stewardship recommendation was one that a number of us made 10 years ago and that unfortunately wasn't adopted uh, because the, the, the belief, at least on the part of some, was that resistance wouldn't, wouldn't become a problem. Interestingly, in 1996, uh, some of the industry's own scientists published a peer-reviewed paper in which they said resistance can happen. And I guess I just would just say that my confidence that salmon can't escape a hatchery or a or, or waterway is about as high as my confidence that weeds don't evolve resistance to glyphosate herbicide now that we have 28 species that have evolved resistance since 1996 that now infest 60 million acres. So I, I think we have to be real. We, we know biology, we know uh, population genetics. We should, we should put the best science and the best minds and also be honest about what we know and what's likely to happen, as opposed to either burying, at least in the case of the weeds now, burying our heads in the sand or being dishonest about the likelihood that these resistance problems would arise. So I guess the other thing I'd add here is something that Dave's already said, but just that, you know, it is very trait specific. And so when you ask a question like, is there a problem with GMOs and biodiversity? Um, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, asking, is there uh, a problem with uh, electrical appliances and uh, taking a shower, right? You know, <laughs> maybe if you've got your radio sitting on your bathtub, there's a problem, but, you know, that's probably not something you should worry about with respect to your toaster, you know? Um, and. You know, there, there are very likely some um, applications of genetic engineering in plants uh, that uh, don't really raise significant biodiversity concerns. So it, I think I just want to underline uh, this point that uh, when you focus on uh, something as broad a class as GMO, you sometimes lose sight of the fact that most of the uh, particularly biodiversity concerns are actually tied to specific traits and uh, specific kinds of agricultural applications. 
got hung up there for a minute because I really wanted to write down your uh, toasters and water example. That's, <laughs> that's key. Um, so there, there's a lot going on here, and I, I, I want to keep things moving along pretty well. But I, I wanted to shift a little bit to talk about, I think, a related issue to the conversation we've been having, um, especially, Dr. White, from your perspective. There seem to be some really deeply embedded social justice issues around the development and the implementation of genetically modified crops. And we have an audience question here that I'd like to bring up now. Um, so the question is, if, and in parentheses, and that is a big if, uh, GMOs were the only answer to future world hunger, would all other ethical issues evaporate? So there's something to be, there's a question here about, um, related to food, but related to larger concerns too, and the role that genetically modified crops and animal species can play in questions about world hunger. So we've got all these, this range of ethical concerns. And so the hypothetical scenario here is if GMOs were the only answer to this question of world hunger, would we then not worry about these broader environmental concerns, these broader concerns, ethical concerns generally? Well, I guess I'm inclined to say no. Um, you know, I, I think even under that hypothetical, um, you know, there, there, we, we, what we would be in is a situation where, um, and I'm actually, I'm probably going to sound more negative to GM because of the way this question's been phrased than I actually am. But, um, um, you know, we, we, we'd be in a situation where we faced a kind of tragic choice. I mean, you know, how about a different hypothetical? The only solution to world hunger is to reinstitute human slavery. Would we do it? We probably would. Would we feel good about that ethically? We shouldn't feel good about that ethically. So, you know, just because something is the only solution doesn't mean that the ethical issues go away. It just makes it um, a tragic situation. Well, I think for, I mean, for, for, for tribes, uh, and because and, and I'm a climate ethics and climate justice person, you know, you, you, you hear a lot of comments like this, right? I mean, a lot of folks would say, well, if that was, if that was really the case, then tribes would make it work, just like they made it work with commodity foods, right? You get fry bread, which now has great, you know, cultural and social value to it, even though it's bad for you. Um, you know, tribes would make it work, but tribes would engage with D GMOs differently. They would uh, look at research differently. They would. Uh, develop the technologies differently. They would regulate them differently. You know, th th there's a, there's a, 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 it's a stereotype that native people, uh, native cultures are, 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 you know, are stagnant. They are based on one thing that's sort of trapped in time. But that's actually not true, right? If you, if you look historically, native cultures were based on the notion of adaptation. They're always adapting, whether that was across the, the different seasons, right, depending on what culture you're from, um, how you understood those seasons, what environment you're living in, um, but also adapting to metascale forces as, as well, right? Um, so for native people, adaptation is the, is the norm. And with settler colonialism, adaptation ramped up quite a bit, right? You know, like in North America with the fur trade and, and ongoing through a number of, 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 of traumas and, and, and problems. Uh, so I think that's what a lot of folks would say, that they would adapt, but still native people would do things differently and would have different standards than others. And a lot of the power issues that have been discussed here wouldn't necessarily go away. So it would still be the responsibility of non-native people and people representing <coughs> settler states to try to build trust with native people, right? And to try to alleviate some of the concerns about power differentials uh, and other ethical, political, and, and, and justice issues. Um, another thing I wanted to, to add to that that I think was related to other questions, right? You know, an, 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 an example of what might happen in such a future, right, if native people then had to um, engage in GMO research and cultivate those kinds of, of plants and, and animals and, and so on, you know, is the current uh, political system that Native people use adequate? That is our treaty rights, reservation boundaries, uh, trust lands, you know, all, all these sort of uh, political jurisdictions and political tools that Native people use, would they be adequate? They still wouldn't be adequate in that era, era right? I mean, for a lot of tribes, you've got a small area of land that you have jurisdiction over and it's fixed. It doesn't move. It's not going to move. Um, in fact, in a lot of cases, it might be shrinking. So 
if we're having a future where you, GMOs is the only solution, um, tribes are still going to press for the same changes that they're pressing for now, right? Which is the obliteration of things like boundaries and borders that don't come from from tribes, um, but they come from the the settler society, and they're meant to enclose tribal people. Uh, so, so that's another issue that I think would remain even in that in that sort of future. To shift just a little bit, although I think it's related, um, we had a question for you about whether or not consumers or individuals uh, generally have the right to be informed as to whether or not a food has been genetically modified. And we were thinking in the context of uh, Vermont's recent Right to Know GMO coalition, uh, which is currently facing legal challenges. But we had a, a related, a very closely related question from the audience. And here that question is, um, labels can convey useful information to inform an electorate and thus advance democratic processes. Labels can also function as a brand to capture markets and even be used to uh, as propaganda to advance a political agenda. So this question is asking you to discuss the ethics of labeling GMOs, maybe related to these state-based um, initiatives, and how the method of the label influences its function. So this is a question about the, the sort of, uh, it's an epistemic question about the ability of consumers or the public broadly construed understand what's going on in genetic modification in the food stream and in wider context as well. So this is actually an issue that I've been writing on for um, 20 some odd years. Um, so to, to kind of state the, the uh, case against uh, mandatory labels, um, you know, one of the, the problems with any kind of law, whether it's a state law or federal policy, uh, that re would require labeling is that it's a form of compulsory speech. And um, we um, have a fairly strong tradition, and it's a tradition I actually think I would support in the United States, that uh, we're very cautious about circumstances in which we uh, require someone to speak uh, or to identify themselves. And, and uh, those conditions usually involve pretty high burdens of proof that uh, there's uh, some potential risk. So if you're a convicted felon and uh, you move into the neighborhood, we have laws that require you to disclose that. Um, and that's because we believe that there's a significant risk and parents in the neighborhood have a right to know that. Um, if you're uh, producing uh, uh, something uh, that uh, uh, has some sort of uh, risk to the people that use it or that uh, handle it, um, you know, that would be information that might be required to be disclosed. Uh, but we don't require you to disclose what your racial or ethnic background is if you want to buy a house. We don't require you to disclose what religious tradition you come from if you want to buy a house. Uh, and in fact, we actually have a pretty strong burden of proof, or, or pretty strong tradition, which would suggest that that's actually problematic. So, in, 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 you know, to get back to the GMO question, I mean, this actually does get sort of wrapped up in some of the substantive risk questions because if there, um, it, you know, if the scientific consensus is that the food safety risks are are not there or that uh, uh, some of the environmental risks are not there, uh, then um, that's going to cut very uh, strongly against um, any kind of requirement that one label. Now, I would also argue, and I have argued in print on numerous occasions. Uh, that uh, what people deserve and have a right to uh, is, uh, uh, is I, I, I'm going to use a technical word, exit. They have a right to not eat genetically engineered foods if they don't want to. Um, and uh, so the, the reason why some sort of a label would be material to that is that it allows them to exercise that right. They, you know, we, we would regard it as horrible if you put uh, um, observant co people who observe kosher or halal rules into a position where they could not make dietary choices on the basis of those kinds of cultural beliefs. There's no um, scientific backing for that. We would find it, um, a, you know, really problematic if you put most of the people in this room into a position where they couldn't uh, choose not to eat meat from dogs or cats. Um, there's no scientific basis for that. You know, it's perfect. You can, per you know, you can eat meat from 
dogs and cats, but it's not, um, you know, it, it's not going to make you sick or problematic. But we have fairly strong culturally based beliefs that uh, uh, we shouldn't be put in a position. Now, um, it's very easy in our society to avoid being put in a position where you eat dogs or cats. Uh, so this doesn't come up as a big thing for public debate. Um, but, um, you know, if, if, we, we, if we created a situation that made it impossible for people to eat on the basis of, you know, <coughs> cultural, political, outright wacky values, um, it, they, they don't, you don't really need to have a good justification for what you think are your basis for what you want to eat. Um, so um, we, you know, have come close to that uh, with genetic engineering, and uh, I think we were actually in that situation in the late 90s. Now, the way you avoid it is you eat organic. That's, um, you know, it's a label that sort of functions to predict exit. I don't think it's a good enough uh, label. I would like to see the food industry embrace some sort of non-GMO labeling as a kind of service and as a kind of acknowledgement of the importance of this cultural issue to uh, consumers. Uh, but I'm not entirely sure that I want to go so far as to uh, endorse laws that uh, compel uh, companies to label. So um, it's, a, it's a really tricky situation. I sort of waffle on this. I, 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 I feel like the food industry has been so recalcitrant and so resistant to this that, you know, I think if this law came up in Michigan, I'd vote for it, you know. Uh, but I do see that there's a real serious ethical problem uh, associated with these mandatory labeling kinds of laws. It's made even trickier by our thoughtful audience who just suggested um, that there's a potential for labeling GMOs to be seen as unethical even because that food is typically cheaper, according to this questioner. And so there's a there's an economic justice question about a question of access that only individuals with a particular level of income can eat organic, as you might suggest. And so you labeling know, labeling GMOs might have a negative effect ethically. I don't think a voluntary label would necessarily have that effect. Um, um, I mean, it would be very comparable to the organic label. Um, many people assume that because something is labeled as organic, it's either um, higher quality or more or healthier uh, and uh, um, you know, it, it, I think you have exactly the same kind of impact uh, associated with the organic level, yet, you know, of course, a lot of people, uh, you know, organic is still only, a, you know, something like 5 to 7 percent of uh, the food that people purchase. So I rather suspect that uh, even if we had uh, foods that were labeled as containing GMOs, or, or my preference would be GMO-free, uh, you'd, you'd see people sort of sort that out on the basis of their own values. To push the boundaries of that a little bit, um, and I think, Dr. Mortensen, this might be a, a question for you. Um, several people have asked about a fundamental problem they see as a question of who decides. So it's a policy question directly related to this idea of labeling and um, knowledge about GMOs uh, or GM um, substances in our environment and our food. So who does decide from a policy perspective? Should it be the federal government who regulates new GM technology? Should it be up to the states? Should it be an individual choice based on something like labeling? Um, I know you've done work in, here in Pennsylvania in our legislature, um, so you might be able to respond in a um, local way. Yeah, so a group of us were, were down appearing in front of the House Ag and Rural Affairs Committee last week. Um, and I would say that question didn't come up. The question of labeling didn't come up. Actually, it was a lot of discussion of the science, um, the backdrop. Um, and I, so I, I uh, who decides? Um, maybe first, I have given this subject also a lot of thought, and I have not written anything about it in contrast. Uh, to Paul's spending a great deal of time and thought on this subject. Um, and for me, it actually gets very personal because I've been following and deeply engaged in this, in, in legislation that actually will um, allow the, this new wave of crops with these new genes and, and, addition, and, and very significant increase in herbicide use. That actually has tipped me to think that labeling is a good idea. I, I, I'm not sure that I thought that three or four years ago. 
but I think that now because I think that the impact of the input traits on our cropping systems and the aggregation of pesticides and GMO traits leads me to think that there are better ways to produce crops and they can be produced conventionally, not, or, not necessarily organically. Uh, during one of the discussions we had over the lunch hour, before I had to run off to teach, someone was making the point that what would be the point of GMO-free labeling when most of our grain crops are already GMO grain crops. Pennsylvania soybean production, 93 or 5 percent of it was genetically modified this past summer. But the fact is, is that, that most all of the vegetables are not genetically modified, nor are the fruits. Um, most of the crops that we, grew, that we eat fresh are not modified. Um, and so I see, I see a value. I, I don't know what the cost of that is to, to the food production system. I know that segregation, keeping things separate in the supply chain, costs something. But I don't see anything wrong with the consumer, which I believe has a right to know how the food was produced. And, and I do believe that there are environmental costs to this packaging, as I've described. So who does that? I am not sure. Obviously, as you know, as you just stated, Vermont, so it's being done at a state-by-state -state kind of level right now. There is a bill in front of the Pennsylvania legislature. Um, and I, I, I don't know how all well that's going to unfold. So right now, my, my sense is it's being handled at the state level. And, uh, you know, and, and the decisions will be made by legislators and by the voting public. You know, are you concerned about this? Um, and, and that's, I think, how it, as it should be. And so, in my opinion, then, it becomes really important when we talk about these issues here at Penn State, all these folks in the room, and the students hear this from me when they take my classes. <laughs> I feel passionately about this. That we have to work to connect the people to the food system. You can't have people voting for things. You can't have folks having meaningful discussions in our cities and rural areas across the United States about food policy if we don't understand our food system. So I am convinced, absolutely convinced, that we have to make a concerted push to uh, bring along the public so that we are able to have a democratic discussion about the methods by which you know, we produce our food and the way that we label them. Uh, so I think it's like, to me, it's a two-pronged thing. We need to have the education moving aggressively, thoughtfully, creatively, connecting people to the food system. And then at the same time, we need to be look, taking a critical and open debate and discussion about um, the ways that we currently are producing the food so that we can uh, get informed policy as quickly as possible and then, and then enhance that as we go along. Relatedly, uh, Dr. Grumman, we've had several questions from the audience about um, policy implications in the European context as it relates to the United States context. We've had a question about whether or not uh, what you think of the European Union's de facto moratorium on licensing of GM applications, and also whether or not or to what extent the sorts of methodologies, um, uses of genetic modified organisms are the same in Europe. For instance, um, does Norway have Roundup Ready crops? Is, this the sim is there a, um, enough parallel to, for you to feel comfortable in a discussion like this? Yeah, for one thing, there's a huge difference between United States and Europe because here it's all about substantial equivalence and in Europe we look at the whole process and methods and we don't look, we look at the method and not at the product. So the product is not important. It's about how you do this. And if you use a GM method, it's already uh, even soy uh, or kind of uh, product is uh, free of, or, of all at the, in the end where you check it. There is no uh, GMO uh, visible. Then uh, in Europe still there is, you could say, uh, regu regulation. And the regulation is uh, severe. 
and also uh, a lot very complicated many stages uh, loops and you have to spend uh, maybe uh, 1 billion euros on one cr new crop and uh, only very big international companies can do that and even then there are only two crops now that are allowed in the EU however every country has the right to refuse this so Spain is one of the <laughs> few countries where there is corn and um, the other thing is that a lot of the applications uh, after a while end up at the desk of the European Commission and then they have to be signed and there is no uh, time frame in the regulation to do that so they don't so ju 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 they just don't sign it off so years later it's still in the waiting and of course this is uh, a kind of strange thing it's uh, also the, uh, the new commissioner uh, in, uh, um, that is in charge of this regulation says I want to make it more simple and also to give uh, individual countries more power autonomy meaning that a lot of the countries southern countries uh, like Italy or France or they just of course will not uh, use uh, GM in the future so there's a lot of opposition and maybe um, can be the case that is even uh, as you suggested earlier maybe uh, that even companies themselves they ask in the first place for regulation in the past so uh, but now they are more the victim of their own uh, yeah uh, ideas because now they they can only uh, play when they have a lot of money and probably uh, from a trade perspective it is okay to keep all M companies out of Europe and uh, have their own uh, seeds and uh, make a lot of money because uh, most of the seed companies they invest one or two cents in the seed and they can ask 50 euro cents making a bag or one kilo of uh, tomato seed is more precious than a kilo of gold so uh, these companies earn a lot they earned already a lot in the past but they are comfortable in uh, not using GM in vegetables and go just go on as they always did and only the companies having chemicals uh, the link they of course pressure to uh, get in and to to sell uh, their also their chemicals and uh, I think there is an, indeed uh, a kind of but if like Monsanto uh, a few years ago tried to at the back door introduce GM potatoes in Bulgaria and for free give them to farmers for free uh, only because Bulgaria was a, was on the verge of coming into uh, the EU and then the EU had a problem because then there was a country using uh, and then they there was a precedent so uh, yeah uh, I said to the guy from Monsanto I thought you were now um, more or less uh, ethical uh, com committed to ethical uh, actions and not to just uh, do this and he said yeah but this is uh, our new strategy <laughs> <laughs> and we hope that uh, the past, the, what we did, the bad reputation of the past is now gone. But I think, yeah, even introducing it in that way is still not uh, ethically sound. So, so far this evening, we've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, one other uh, category of ethical issue that we had thought of as a panel that's come up in, in questions from our audience as well are questions about health human health and non-human welfare, both. So I've got questions that relate both to those topics, um, whether or not any long-term health studies have been done on the effects of GM crops or organisms on human health, and also whether um, genetic modification of non-human organisms has harmed any way, any non-human organisms have been harmed in the implementation of genetic, genetic modification. Um, and the example there was coming back to the example of the genetically modified salmon. Uh, 
So these questions about health and welfare seem to be another ethical issue that we'd like to uh, have the panel address a little bit. And you could take either one of those approaches, whether you're interested in questions about human health or uh, non-human welfare. But both of those things, I think, are pretty intimately related. So, thoughts on health or welfare? So the answer to have there been any long-term studies done would certainly be no. Um, I don't think there have been any long-term studies done on any food item as it relates to health. And it would be actually very difficult to figure out how you would design such a study. Um, so um, there have been, um, primarily in Europe, very long-running studies on animal health associated with consumption of, of GM grains. Uh, and uh, by very long, I'm talking about, what, five, seven years, something like that? Um, you know, um, GM crops basically came on the market in 1997, so, uh, you know, for a, a 30 or 40 or 50 year trial, we still have a ways to go yet. Um, as, as it relates to uh, animal health and well-being, uh, I would come back to the trait point. Um, it's there have been some uh, modifications that uh, very quickly uh, were seen to lead to horrendous impacts on animal health, and uh, the animals were euthanized. Um, there are some others that are sort of in a in a gray zone. Um, they uh, may make uh, they may involve uh, exposing animals to higher rates of uh, risk. Actually, a, a, a biotech product that has been used in the United States is uh, uh, RBST or bovine growth hormone. Um, it's, it's basically produced through a recombinant bacterium, but uh, it makes dairy cows produce more. Uh, and in the United States, the studies indicated that uh, uh, the animal health issues associated with using uh, RBST were uh, roughly comparable to that of all high producing uh, dairy cows. And so the decision in the United States was, well, the risk here is high producing dairy cows. Uh, if BST <coughs> makes a cow move into that group, uh, all it's doing is just, uh, you know, putting you into the same risk factors as other high producing dairy cows. In most other parts of the world, um, it was actually, it has not been approved, primarily on animal health reasons. Uh, and, you know, if the objective is to uh, lower the rate of um, animal disease, then things that keep you from having more high producing dairy cows will do that. So there becomes kind of a rationale for not approving RBST uh, on similar kinds of grounds. Uh, there have been some transgenic animals produced um, primarily to, uh, there are, there's a, a herd of uh, transgenic cattle out in, uh, I think they're in South Dakota that were produced to produce uh, a clotting factor um, for blood transfusions. I've never been out to see those cows. I'd love to go out and see them sometime. Uh, but all the reports that I get is that, you know, those are very normal cows who, um, because they have this value, are living much, much longer uh, than your average uh, dairy or beef cow. And they seem to be doing just fine, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years into this transformation. So again, with the, the toaster point, um, you can do modifications that are terrible, but that um, doesn't mean that all GM is necessarily inimical to animal health. I'd like to just cover two more, two more uh, topics, value-laden topics. One of those is uh, coming from um, one of our viewers, or uh, I hope viewers, potentially listeners online this evening. And um, I think this is an important uh, facet that we haven't touched on explicitly, but economic considerations. And so Mike and Kristen and I, ah, so we've got several comments now along this line um, about economic considerations. So Mike and Kristen and I had uh, drafted a question for you about whether or not farmers might become dependent on corporate entities for for crops for any number of reasons. And one of our listeners online has asked a question about whether or not or to what extent we need a critique of capitalism itself um, before we can even get to these deeper lying ethical considerations. Um, and similarly, 
what economic costs to herbicides or related to herbicides in their use in GMOs uh, might be addressed. So there's this whole gamut that we've that I'd like to touch on specifically with you now about economic considerations, whether that's on farmers or whether that's on systems in general, capitalist systems specifically in this question. Comments on critiques of capitalism. Kyle? I would like to say that the uh, main reason for doing all this is that people, consumers, are not willing to produce the food themselves anymore, like in the past. Only 2% of the population are farmers or less. So uh, you could say, from an economic point of view, uh, there was a kind of differentiation, specialization, and uh, the ones doing it uh, need large field to feed the rest. And if the rest is saying, OK, we don't like to eat meat anymore, because why do we use these large quantities of maize and corn? Like the Dutch situation, uh, thank you very much, Brazil, Argentina, and the US, because you send us huge quantities of GM, soya, and maize for our animals. And uh, we couldn't be uh, an exporter for milk if we couldn't get that. So we use five or six times the area of Holland to, in other countries to feed our cattle and pigs. So uh, you could say, OK, uh, if we don't do that anymore, then uh, the result is that uh, people, consumers, uh, will get less food and almost no meat once a week, maybe. Uh, so that's also a, a choice, I, w I would say. So uh, monocropping, uh, using chemicals, uh, fertilizer, it's all linked in a system uh, to get uh, uh, plenty of food uh, in the stores. So if you will change that from an economic point of view, a totally other system, that's, that's, that's fine. But then, of course, a lot of lifestyle things have to change also. Uh, if people say to me, I'm so glad that I can buy this uh, broiler chicken meat from the breast because it is neutral from taste. And in five minutes' time, I just chop it up. I uh, uh, in the pan, and it's uh, OK, some uh, herbs. And because I work all day, and also my wife, it is, we eat within 10 minutes. Great. But the broiler only lives six weeks. So if you tell them, are you prepared to, to let them another other way? No, I'm not prepared. I want cheap meat that is from that quality, and that's it. So it's a kind of uh, strange thing that people are so concerned and so about everything, but they themselves are, could say, the main reason why uh, this system uh, is there. Yeah, on the issue of capitalism, and I, I know capitalism can mean a lot of things, so let's just assume that what I mean is what all of you mean, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I was looking recently at a white paper issued a couple of years ago from the Chippewa tribe of Minnesota to the University of Minnesota about uh, uh, research and genetically modify or research on the wild rice genome. And one of the, the lines from that white paper was that the Chippewa tribe really had a problem that the university didn't come to them from the beginning and say, look, we're interested in in studying and learning more about wild rice, let's figure out a, a program to work on this together, right? The university presupposed that the key thing to start with, you know, was uh, understanding the genome and, and not, say, for example, focusing on, on water quality or, or another thing you could research to learn more about wild rice. And so there you get this issue, issue that for a lot of Native people, it's about free prior and informed consent. And in some of my own research interviewing people that have worked in Native cooperative uh, conservation and climate change adaptation, for a lot of Native people, free prior and informed consent doesn't mean you decide what to do and before you pull the trigger, you inform Native people. It actually means that Native people are there at the conception of the project meaning that you've already violated f free prior and informed consent if you say, oh, I want to study um, genetic modification, and then you talk to tribes who could be affected by environmental implications of that. 
So for a lot of tribes, uh, they would like to be there as partners early on and work together collaboratively toward figuring out what to research in the first place on something like rice or, or another thing that there might be a shared value for. Um, but the question is, there's not a lot of funding, at least in my experience, for research that meets that standard of cooperation with tribes. And that is definitely a matter of capitalism. So one of the questions I would pose is whether the capitalist uh, system as is can actually um, uh, can actually sort of face up to free prior and informed consent like native people demand it. I think there's a lot of reasons to suggest that it's not and that you wouldn't get meaningfully funded research that uh, would meet that standard. So yeah. maybe just one, one other thought about, about the cost and the economics. Um, I, I think I think it's messy, um, and uh, what I th what I think I observed when I was in the Midwest happening from the late '80s as the economic crisis in in agriculture was peaking and maybe past peak, farmers losing their farms due to economic uh, meltdowns, farmers were overextended. Um, what I've observed over, over, over the period is that the some of the technologies that have taken hold in my career's time um, are, te it was interesting when I started, that a big hot thing that everybody talked about was the farms in the middle. What's happening to the farms in the middle? This is the middle-sized American farm. Many of them were going under financially in the early to mid-80s. And, um, and, and that the research that you do, actually, we were, we were all talking about this back in those days, should be scale neutral or should favor small and farms in the middle. Um, what, what I saw unfold over the period, and, and this, yeah, I guess I'm sounding kind of critical here on a number of these questions, but what, what happened was the, um, there was a, sh a shift from the per acre profitability. It took me about five years to really fully wrap my head around this. Farmers weren't thinking about per acre profit. They were thinking about farm scale profit. So if you had a 250 acre farm and you could increase the farm to 750 acres, you could sacrifice on per acre profit and efficiency in order to farm three times as much land. The farmstead profit increased. Genetically modified, at least, at least herbicide-resistant crops have facilitated increased farm size over the period uh, of, of the evolution of the technology. I don't think anyone would argue that. Um, the, the time in the field was reduced. Um, the necessity to go back to the fields was reduced, so labor was reduced, uh, and the farms got bigger. Was that the only thing that was happening during that time? No, but was it an important driver? Yes. Companies were, while I was in Nebraska, offering incredible price breaks if you bought a big chunk of the, the package as opposed to a small chunk of the package discounts on the order of 15 to 25 percent if you ordered 1,000 acres worth versus 100 acres worth. These were drivers that, uh, that farmers responded to understandably because they were economically stretched. The farms got bigger. The challenge is then, what, so what, is, what are the economics of it? It depends, right? It depends on how big the place is, it, it depends on a number of factors. Obviously, it's economically attractive to farmers that, that are trying to manage the crops in this method um, because I think the technology has evolved with the increasing farm size. We had uh, saved a question for the end about what extent or in what ways can we help educate our colleagues and peers and communities about genetically modified organisms uh, that will help extend the discussion in fruitful ways. I think one of the issues that 
I see isn't discussed enough, though it's implicit in a lot of the conversations about GMOs, is the relationship between research on genetic modification and the self-determination of communities like tribes, indigenous peoples, and others. The principle of self-determination is increasingly uh, being invoked for indigenous people and others. It's been part of the international moral system for a long, long time. But really today, especially with indigenous people, we're really unpacking practically what does it look like to put self-determination in practice. And all of these environmental implications, environmental dimensions, issues of uh, GMO research um, need to be tied back to how they ultimately relate to indigenous people's exercise of the right to self-determination. Dr. Thompson? Yeah, I'm not sure I have anything particularly deep or intelligent to say in answer to this question. I mean, this is this you know forum that you've organized here is is probably um, you know um, one model for how to do that, and uh, um, it's uh, great to see so many people turn out, and uh, uh, and it's great to you know have some uh, some good discussion uh, about these questions, and and I think much beyond that, I'm going to pass it on down to Bart. You've got your own microphone. Yeah, could be. <laughs> Don't give him our microphone. No. <laughs> yes, I agree, Paul. But uh, ideally, uh, if you compare the situation with the software development and IT, uh, in the 80s and 90s, people were able to more or less uh, in, at home also learn about software and write their own software. And uh, a lot of uh, hobby and enthusiasts, enthusiastic people did this. And there was a now it's open source and stuff came out of that. So and a lot of uh, innovation is taking place in your backyard in a garage. So that's nice. But uh, ideally, I would like to get that all people would get a kind of greenhouse, small greenhouse like this, and some seeds, and then start uh, keeping them huh, alive and and what getting a feeling for what it is to uh, be a bit farmer, but also some experimenting with it. And um, I think that, that would also bring uh, city people back uh, a bit to uh, the countryside, because I think there's a gap. And uh, of course, you can uh, use uh, social media and also cameras and stuff like that, uh, uh, kind of uh, in the new way to do that. But a uh, hands-on experience, I think that's very important, and we lost that. And uh, so people, hobby gardeners know, yes, you, you are also a bit like gardener, uh, I read, wrote. Yeah. So, that, so this is a kind of, um, yeah, I would say, uh, opportunity to, uh, yeah, another way of uh, getting in touch with the GMs, and even, in a while, you get just buy them. Yeah, I, I I would echo what Paul said. I think this is this this has been awesome. I've had a great day talking with students and meeting the panel and meeting the ethics group here, which has been a real pleasure for me. Um, so I thank you for that. I also would say that. Um, life scientists should embrace opportunities to engage in policy when they have them and maybe make those opportunities if they don't exist in your labs uh, or in your, in your, in your space. Uh, some of the most fruitful, stimulating times that I've had over the last three or four years here um, have been some of the road trips we took to DC where I watched my own graduate students presenting to the EPA scientists at the national headquarters or when we would uh, be meeting with USDA decision makers on things like this 2,4-D dicamba um, herbicide resistant crop issue. It doesn't always go the way you want it to go, uh, but the education for me uh, and also for my students and postdocs and others that have engaged, uh, undergraduates certainly could tag along and get involved with that as well. 
if we if we made it known more if we thought about that. But in any case, I would say, you know, a lot of this is science and the interface between science and policy, and we should, while we're in school, get an opportunity to uh, explore the the power that that nexus um, uh, is with regard to how we do things on the land. Well, um, as you're all aware, we are out of time now, and I apologize for the, uh, the shortage of Q&A. Our panelists are happy to stick around for a few minutes afterwards to speak with you. But for those of you who have to leave, I'd like us all to help thank our panelists for a great talk this evening. And thank you again for sticking around. Feel free to come down and talk with us a little bit more. <laughs>